I'm going to be talking about, um, as the slide suggests, um, protecting the dignity of claimants, uh, preventing poverty, and uh, promoting social inclusion, and the contribution that uh, social security systems at devolved level, uh, particularly here in Northern Ireland, but also in, in Scotland, can, um, can make to that. Um, and I'm going to be drawing quite heavily on a piece of research on uh, dignity and respect in social security systems that I um, co-authored for the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, to help with that. Um, I'm going to um, have to skip quite quickly over some of the slides today because there's um, quite a lot of content here for 20 minutes, but if there's anything that you need to pick me up on in questions or informally afterwards, please do so. So, um, very short introduction to um, the division of responsibility for social security within the UK. Um, most of you are probably aware that um, in England and Wales, social security is almost entirely the responsibility of the UK government. Um, in Northern Ireland, social security is a fully devolved matter, but that's subject to the well-known parity convention under which the uh, rates of and the conditions for receipt of uh, benefits um, are almost always the same as apply in England and Wales. Um, things are a bit more complicated in Scotland. Most aspects of social security there are reserved to the UK government, but um, just within the, in, within the last two years, some powers have been devolved for about 15% of the system in expenditure terms. Um, and that's mostly focused on disability benefits, although there are some um, flexibilities in the, in the payment arrangements for universal credit as well. Um, to look for at, the, at the first of the, of the big themes for the, the presentation then, um, dignity in social security systems, this is a link that's been recognized for, for many decades in international law. If we go back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, social security is indispensable for the protection of human dignity. We also see this in the, uh, in the interpretation of the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, in Scotland then, in the Social Security Bill, or the Social Security Act as it, as it now is, as of the last couple of weeks, um, we see this now reflected in, uh, in domestic law um, with this principle that respect for the dignity of individuals should be at the heart of the devolved social security system. Now there's no equivalent, no direct equivalent to that in Northern Ireland, but what we do have is an obligation on the devolved institutions to comply with the European Convention on Human Rights. And the European Court of Human Rights tells us that the protection of dignity is at the very heart of that convention, so it's still a, a relevant consideration. Um, if we look to the other two broad themes of poverty and social inclusion, um, again, we can see in international law a link between uh, social security and protection against poverty. We can see it in the Social Security Act in Scotland. Again, another of the principles of that act is that the Scottish social security system will contribute to reducing poverty. Um, again, there isn't quite such a direct link in Northern Ireland, but there is this requirement in the Northern Ireland Act that the executive should uh, develop a strategy to um, address uh, poverty and social, social exclusion and deprivation. And logically, um, if Social Security is so central to reducing poverty, which for very obvious reasons it is, um, then there's a, there is an argument that that strategy should at least um, give, have some sort of regard to what uh, kind of social security provision is required. Um, rewinding a little bit and focusing for a couple of slides on this, uh, this concept of dignity. Um, the first problem that we encounter, and this was what the, uh, the work for the Equality and, and uh, Human Rights Commission was really trying to address, the, the biggest problem if we set out to build um, a social security system or, or any field of policy on the protection of dignity is that um, although this is a concept that comes up again and again and again in human rights law, um, it's actually a concept that um, there's not a lot of agreement as to what it actually means in practice. Um, 
Now, there has been an enormous amount of ink spilled debating this issue in the academic texts, and I don't claim to have the definitive answer to what dignity actually means. But um, Chris McCrudden, who has uh, spent a lot of time, a lot more time than me on this question, um, has come up with what I think is one of the most persuasive explanations of what's required to protect people's dignity, um, which is to protect them from inhuman and degrading treatment, um, to ensure that people can enjoy a measure of autonomy, uh, to protect cultural identity, and uh, to create the conditions in which people can um, access their essential needs. And I've highlighted that last one in particular because for me that's the one that's the most directly relevant to social security because if you don't have enough of an income, you're not going to be able to access your essential needs. Now, having said that, this brings us on to a further problem which is that again when we look at essential needs there isn't necessarily a single accepted definition of, of what these are. But we do have quite a, um, or how much money that, uh, that is needed to access them for that matter. Um, but a couple of sources that we can look at, um, if we look at the money that's, uh, that the allowance that's given to asylum seekers in order to protect them from destitution while they're waiting for a, a decision about their claim, this suggests that um, an allowance of about 38 pounds a week is possibly enough as a bare minimum to access your essential needs after housing costs. Um, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation's work on destitution in the UK sets the bar a little bit higher for adults at least. Uh, 70 pounds per week, uh, 100 pounds for a couple or 20 pounds per child. Again, that's after your housing costs have been met. Um, whichever of those two definitions we take, uh, if we compare that to the rate that, um, that out-of-work benefits are paid at in the UK, um, we can probably conclude that at its full rate, the benefits should be enough to allow people to meet their essential needs. Now, if you're subject to a sanction, obviously that, that changes, but in terms of the full rates of benefit at least. Um, but there is another important aspect to um, the protection of dignity. It's not just a legal concept. It's not just about having enough money to meet your essential needs. Um, it's also a subjective issue. You know, people know when they're treated with dignity and when they're not, perhaps more obviously when they're not. And there's quite a lot of, um, of uh, social policy research on, on, this, um, on this question. And Again, one of the things that people talk about in terms of uh, dignity in the social security system is not having enough money to meet their essential needs or to enjoy any sort of social participation. But there's another aspect to this as well, which is the way people are treated by the system and by the people who are responsible for, uh, for operating it. And I, I should stress that most of this research has been carried out in, in England. Um, but we do see this finding that people are uh, perceived, claimants perceive that they're treated with suspicion, that they're looked upon as work shy, for example, um, perhaps by job centre staff, perhaps by the media, perhaps by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, depending um, on, uh, on, on who they're, they're talking to or who they're reading. Um, and it's in this area of how claimants interact with the social security system that uh, we can really point to some ways in which Scotland and Northern Ireland have been either attempting to or promising to uh, protect the dignity of claimants a little bit better than may be the case in, um, in England and Wales. So um, in Scotland, for example, um, making emergency support through the Scottish Welfare Fund available to people, claimants who have been sanctioned. Um, making participation in, in devolved employment schemes voluntary so be sanctioned if you don't participate um, and the duty on ministers to promote take up of benefits that people are entitled to and it's a similar story in many ways in Northern Ireland if we look at the, um, at the lower rate at which sanctions are applied to claimants um, again a very well regarded um, benefit take up campaign um, and the making of pay uh, 
claimants who have been found that their eligibility for a benefit should be terminated while they're appealing that decision. So a few signs of doing things differently. Um, I'll look a little bit more quickly at the issues of poverty and social exclusion. Now, the UK poverty measures should hopefully be fairly well known, particularly the relative low income threshold at 60% of the median. Um, social exclusion is a little bit more nebulous, it's a little bit more subjective what you need to enjoy a normal standard of living, but DWP suggests that perhaps that relative poverty line is what's needed. Again, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation is a little bit more generous. It suggests that you might need 75% of the, of the median income to enjoy the goods and services and activities that, that make up a normal lifestyle. Um, so the thing that, uh, w one thing that unites these, uh, these issues of dignity, uh, poverty and social exclusion is the idea that people need um, a minimum level of income to enjoy a minimum standard of living, even if we can debate where that, that, that minimum income needs to be. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on the, the various social security reforms that we've seen since 2012 um, or since 2015 in Northern Ireland, but quite a few of these reforms have the effect of lowering the incomes of people who are claiming the, the benefits concerned. Um, and in particular, if we look at the, the benefit cap, um, the, um, and the, uh, the two child limit on child tax credits and universal credit, a lot of these reforms fall quite heavily upon households with dependent children. Um, and that has led to a number of legal challenges based on the uh, various rights to, related to social security that, that apply to children. And these cases have created, have brought about um, quite a range of different and sometimes very contradictory judgments. So in challenges to the benefit cap, we see some judges saying that there's, well, virtually all judges conclude that there's discrimination against lone parents. Some say that it's contrary to the best interests of the child. Some say that it's not. Some say it doesn't matter. Um, Ultimately, the majority feel that the policy can be justified by its objectives of cutting expenditure and encouraging employment. Um, a Northern Ireland case challenged to the exclusion of um, unmarried employees from bereavement benefits. Again, the High Court found that the policy was inimicable to the interests of the child and therefore unlawful. The Court of Appeal disagreed. Um, and again, when we look at the social sector size criteria or, uh, or bedroom tax, as it's sometimes known, different judges have reached diff very different decisions about the, um, about the lawfulness of the policy. But again, the majority say that in most cases, the ill effects of it can be adequately dealt with through discretionary housing payments um, from, uh, um, from local authorities if you're in Great Britain. Um, so for the last part of the presentation, I'm going to focus on, the, uh, on one of the most recent reforms, which is the two-child limit on tax credits and universal credits. Um, as you're probably aware, from April 2017, if you're claiming child tax credits or universal credit, um, you, can't, um, you can't claim any additional benefit for a third or subsequent child who's born, who's born after that date in April 2017. Um, this has been projected to have quite a significant impact on child poverty levels within the UK, um, an additional quarter of a million children in poverty by 2020, and the deepening of poverty for another quarter of a million. So it is quite a significant impact. Um, again, this policy has been judicially reviewed in Great Britain. And um, again, as with the benefit cap cases, the uh, High Court found that uh, there was discrimination against, um, against women, specifically against lone parents in the policy, but again that this discrimination has been justified, is justified by the objectives of the policy of reducing expenditure, promoting employment and increasing fairness in the, in the system. Um, now the judicial review in Northern Ireland is still pending, um, or the, the outcome is still pending. The 
previous cases show that we can't necessarily take it for granted that it'll go the same way as in Great Britain, but it's probably um, fairly likely that it will. Certainly when we look at the various cases that, that I've very briefly um, given you an overview of, what we see is that the courts um, are not a reliable means of protecting people against poverty or against income cuts. Um, the solution to that is in places like this through the legislature. Um, and I think there are sufficiently strong poverty drivers at devolved level that say that this in particular is an issue that should be, uh, that should be looked at by the, by the devolved governments. Um, so some of those reasons are the kind of the broad overarching objectives that I've talked about in terms of protecting dignity in Scotland, protecting against poverty and promoting social inclusion in Northern Ireland. But there's also some more specific reasons that, uh, that we can look at um, here in Northern Ireland in particular. Um, first of all, any social security reform and particularly any social security cut tends to hit particularly hard in Northern Ireland because of the rates of economic inactivity because of the um, relatively low um, average incomes, and uh, in this case in particular because of the relatively large family sizes. Northern Ireland and London have a much higher uh, proportion of families with three or more children than any other part of the UK. Um, but there's also a potential clash, I would argue, with other objectives of devolved policy. In particular, one of the uh, mitigations that's currently being applied to the, the various welfare reform policies that we've um, inherited here from DWP um, is the disapplication of the benefit cap for families with, um, with, uh, with children. Now, since these families who are benefiting from this mitigation have an average of 3.8 children, once you apply the two child limit to them, the um, the benefit cap mitigation effectively becomes null and void because they're going to be losing the benefit by that means before the benefit cap even becomes, uh, even becomes an issue. Um, there is a potential, a likelihood of an increase in poverty and therefore in social exclusion as a result of it. And less certainly, but at least potentially, there's a threat to the ability of particularly large households to meet their, uh, to meet their essential needs. So that's the case for, if you like, considering doing something, which begs the question of what the options might be. Well, if we wanted to be really ambitious and say let's prevent poverty at devolved level, yeah, the devolved power exists in both Northern Ireland and Scotland to top up benefits to a level that would bring claimants above the poverty line. Now, realistically, that's not going to happen. That would be an enormously expensive undertaking um, for you know, a, a region with relatively limited revenue-raising powers. Um, so we're not going to do that. But there might be a possibility of taking steps to prevent this further increase in poverty that's likely to occur as a result of the, of the two-child limit. Um, Likewise, we're not going to increase benefits to a level that's uh, um, equivalent to the minimum income standard, but we can stop households potentially slipping further below it. And we can help to make sure that households have enough income uh, to meet their essential needs, whether that's by ensuring that they can continue to receive these child-related benefits, by protecting against sanctions, which Northern Ireland, as I've mentioned, is already doing good work on. Um, and making sure that people access the benefits that they should be entitled to. So if there's a suggestion to come out of this, uh, of this presentation, it's that consideration should be given to mitigating the, the two child limit to uh, child tax credits and universal credits. Um, and it is possible to cost this. You'd be looking at 2,780 pounds per year per child who's affected by it. Um, and in Northern Ireland, you're talking then 23.5% of all claimants of, um, of universal credit once it's fully implemented. So um, 8,000 households with three children, 
4,000 households with four or more children. Um, in doing so, we prevent um, a further loss of income for these households. Um, we also protect the policy intent of the benefit cap mitigation, which would be negated otherwise. Um, similarly, in Scotland, you'd be talking about, about 13,000 claimant households, so a slightly lower percentage of the total, but still a significant number. So just to conclude, um, Social Security is, um, by protecting by providing a, a, a minimum income level for people plays a major role in protecting dignity, in protecting against poverty, and in, um, and in promoting social inclusion. Various reforms in recent years have arguably reduced the ability of the social security system to do that. Um, we've seen legal challenges, but the courts tend to defer to the, to the executive and the legislature in this area of policy. They're reluctant to say that whatever the, um, the legislature decides to do in social, in social security is, is unlawful. Um, therefore, we look to the legislature for, uh, for solutions. Northern Ireland and Scotland do have the powers to, um, um, to have an impact in this area, but we need the finance and we need the political will in order for that to happen. Okay, thank you.